real quickly in Matthew 5, and we'll go to Revelation, where we're going to preach from Revelation, but I want to kind of take the springboard off of uh, the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, and notice here in verse 1, seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. <clears throat> Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. Thank you for each one here this morning. We pray that you'll bless the preaching of the word of God. We pray if there's a lost soul in the building here today, we pray you'll save them. We pray for your people, Lord, you'll help us to draw close to you and live for you. Dear Lord, in these last days, help us, God, to be exactly what you would have us to be. And uh, Father, we just thank you that you're still on the throne, that you still hear and answer prayer. God, you're a God that has all power and and all might in heaven and earth. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Here in the uh, book of Matthew chapter 5, we read uh, verses 1 to 11, and these here are often referred to as the Beatitudes. And I'm not going to preach from them. I just wanted to use these verses as a springboard uh, because I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 1. But these... Uh, Beatitudes, uh, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers. These are all these are often referred to as Beatitudes. Now, Beatitudes are special blessings ascribed for a particular reason. Different Beatitudes are found throughout the Scripture. For example, Psalms 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. It says, Blessed. There are many verses throughout the Old and New Testament that says, Blessed is the man that does this. Or, blessed is the person that doesn't do this. Blessed, blessed, blessed. Those are called Beatitudes. Now turn to Revelation. I want to preach on the seven Beatitudes of Revelation. Uh, we've seen some Beatitudes in Matthew 5, and those are the most common ones, and the ones that are referred to the most. But notice here, in uh, Revelation chapter 1, this is the first one that I'm preaching on the seven Beatitudes of Revelation. Revelation 1, 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now that's self-explanatory. The Bible uh, promises a special blessing for those that, first of all, read. Blessed is he that readeth. Americans, uh, for the most part, people in America have quit reading the Bible, and especially the book of Revelation. A lot of people don't read the book of Revelation and study the book of Revelation because uh, they have been told by uh, people that it's, uh, you know, apocalyptic and it's symbolical and figurative and, and, uh, and all these different things. And, uh, and so forth. But I want to say that they've been told that it's a figurative and symbolical. And, uh, but God says that we're blessed if we read. Folks, I'll tell you something. The devil will do everything he can to stop you from reading not only the book of Revelation, but the entire Bible. Yeah. He, there, you say, well, don't do, it doesn't do much for me, preacher. It'll do more for you than what you think it does. Yeah, yeah. You see, that word of God going through you and in you like that, 
the Holy Spirit can speak to your heart. So he says you're blessed. Yep. I can't explain why. And I don't really know why, but I just know that he says, blessed is he that readeth, comma, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. So, and you find out that a lot of preachers don't preach on prophecy anymore. Uh, they don't preach on uh, future events. And I'm not saying that that's all that a preacher should preach on, but a lot of preachers uh, haven't really studied that much about future prophetic events. Now, we've gone verse by verse throughout the book of Revelation uh, since I've been the pastor here the last several years. And uh, we've also gone verse by verse in the book of Daniel. Revelation and Daniel are probably the two books that go together the best or the most throughout the Bible. It's kind of hard to teach Daniel without going to Revelation. It's hard to teach Revelation without going to Daniel. And we've taught, of course, many other books, but we've taught both those books uh, verse by verse. I've preached sermons from those books. Uh, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So you're going to be blessed if you not only read and not only hear the words of the prophecy of this book, but keep those things. It doesn't really do a whole lot of good if you read them and hear them, but you don't keep them. All right, but he says you'll be blessed if you read and you hear and you keep these things uh, that are written here uh, in the Word of God. So reading and hearing and keeping these things. The Bible says, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Read. In Isaiah 34, 16. Usually, <coughs> uh, ministerial students, young men, are usually told by older preachers that you need to read a lot. Uh, I told my son Aaron, I said, Son, you need to read a lot. Read the Bible and study, of course, the Bible. But you need to read other things too. Read the Word of God. Blessing, you'll get a blessing by reading Revelation and the entire Bible. But a preacher has to read because a preacher, basically, his job is to try to learn everything he can about everything. Honestly. Now, I'm not talking about wicked things. But I'm talking about things that a preacher's job is to know as much as he can, not only about the Bible. In other words... Uh, there's going to be people in, the, in, in this congregation, in any congregation, that are going to be mechanics. Some, in some congregations, you might have uh, airline uh, flight uh, people that, uh, that fly airplanes. There's some people that are good at art. There's some people, and it's good if a preacher, and I don't really know anything about those areas, so I'm sorry, but uh, it's good if a preacher can know a little bit a lot about a lot of different fields because it helps him in his preaching. I told Aaron, I said, it'll help you in, in your illustrations. You can give illustrations about different things. You have to constantly be reading, especially a pastor. A pastor that pastors the same people and preaches and teaches the same to the same people week in and week out, month in and month out, year after year. Uh, he has to have fresh material. And he has to be constantly having input, reading. And I, I, I read everything. My wife will cut things out for me. Uh, little illustrations little nuggets, little sayings, uh, little outlines. I mean, I read about everything I can get a hold of because uh, not only am I looking for outlines and illustrations, but I'm looking for things that can enhance my message, my sermon. You'll find that a lot of the old-time preachers, especially in the 1800s, early 1900s, they were very good orators. I don't profess to be a great orator, but Spurgeon and those guys, they knew how to speak. And they could give an illustration and they could put that thing together uh, verbally and say it so well verbally that they could paint a picture in your mind. I don't profess to be able to do that. But a lot of preachers can. Uh, a lot of preachers, preachers have different abilities. All right, God's given me the ability to quote scriptures, to learn scripture, to have a good memory, to, to remember scriptures. But uh, illustrations, I'm not really good at. Brother Homer Smith used to tell preachers around the country, he said, Brother Kogel, uh, he said, Brother Kogel beats anything I've ever seen in my life. He said, he, and Brother Homer, he knew tons of preachers. He said, uh, he died 10 years ago, whatever it was. He's like in his 80s. And uh, he said, uh, he said, Brother Kogel, he said, he, he memorizes the scripture, but he reads his illustrations. Most preachers read the scriptures and just tell the illustrations. But uh, I'm not very good at tell. I've never been good at telling stories. I've never been good at, you know, just verbatim, just getting up and ad-libbing 
and telling a story, unless it's a personal story, I can do that, obviously. But uh, preachers have different, I, I heard Brother Mays Jackson preach, some of you have heard of Mays Jackson, and uh, I got uh, a lot of his uh, gold nugget books, outline books years ago, I loaned them out to some preacher and never got them back, but I got still a few of them, and, uh, but I, I heard him preach years ago, and uh, Brother, Brother Mays Jackson, he could just get up and preach and just weave in illustrations like they were nothing in the sermons. Preachers have different abilities. So uh, every Christian is to read and hear the words and keep those things which are written therein. Now turn to Revelation 14. And I'm going to show you the second one. I could go on and on about each one of these, but I want to move along here because i got seven of them. So the first one's in Revelation 1.3. The, the seven Beatitudes of Revelation. Uh, blessed is he that readeth. So you're blessed if you read the, the book of Revelation. And hear the words of this prophecy. Keep those things which are written therein. Now, Revelation 14, 13 is the second beatitude in Revelation. Revelation 14, 13. Now, I don't really have time to develop all this doctrinally because some of these things in Revelation, of course, are doctrinally in the tribulation and millennium. And I don't really have time, but we're going to make spiritual application to today in the church age. Revelation 14, 13 says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, and this is this is during the tribulation. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Now, notice here in Revelation 14, 13, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. And it says, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Notice carefully, people who die in the tribulation have their works follow them. And they are judged for these works later. Your situation in the church age is, is, is different. Your works go ahead of you. And you'll meet your works at the judgment seat of Christ, which we've preached about many times, which Brother Ingesath, the potter, a few weeks ago, uh, major, uh, majored on primarily. Uh, when the judgment seat of Christ is over, your judgment will be passed as a Christian. Now these saints here in Revelation 14 in the tribulation have to get judged sometime in the future. Since the judgment seat of Christ takes place during the tribulation, it is very apparent that the saints who are saved in the tribulation are not judged the same way those saved in the church age are, and they are not judged at the same time and place as those in the church age. Tribulation saints are judged at the great white throne judgment, according to Revelation 11, 18. Now that's what the verse means doctrinally. You say, how do you know if Revelation 14 is a tribulation? Oh man, look, uh, uh, many, many reasons. Revelation 14, 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 140 and 4,000. That's in the tribulation. The Jehovah's Witnesses think it's them. Having his father's name written in their foreheads. I always look in their foreheads and say, I don't see the name written in your foreheads. <laughs> see that? And uh, verse 4, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which followed the lamb. Uh, so forth and so on. This is during the tribulation. So doctrinally, it's tribulation, but I want you to notice... In 14, 13, it says, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Now, I know doctrine against tribulation, as I just mentioned. But you know what, folks? If you're saved, <coughs> you're going to die in the Lord in the yeah, church. Right. Amen. Yeah. Thank God for those that are saved. We go to be with Jesus as soon as we leave this world. Amen. The Bible says uh, uh, there in uh, so, uh, uh, Philippians 1, 21, Paul said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To die is gain. When a Christian dies in the Lord, saved, born again, child of God, uh, he says you're blessed. When you die in the Lord, you are blessed, according to the Bible. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalms 116, verse 15. When a child of God goes home to glory, the Bible says that it's precious in the sight of God. You say, well, it's not very precious to me. I'll tell you, it's not precious to us because we're earthly beings. And we're separated from them for a while. But here in Revelation 14, 13, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, 
that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. I'll tell you what. I want to thank God. I've been saying when I leave this old world, I'm going to die in the Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to die in the Lord. Now look at chapter 16. I got to move along here because I got seven of these. 16 verse 15. Seven beatitudes in Revelation. 16 15. Behold, this is tribulation also. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth. Now, you and I are supposed to watch for the rapture. And keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. I don't have time to go through all that verse. We went through it in Revelation, our verse by verse study. But uh, Revelation 16, 15, this is a uh, the Lord coming back uh, at a post-tribulation rapture, which we went over. But there's still application for you and I today. He says, Behold, I come as a thief. I'll tell you, when the Lord raptures the church, which is imminent, can happen any second, he's going to come back as a thief. You don't know when a thief's going to break in. I hope a thief never breaks into your home. Now I'm saying you don't know when a thief's going to break in. He says, behold, I come as a thief. I come as a thief. And I have a message I preach about uh, the Lord coming back as a thief in the night. Blessed is he that watcheth. If you watch for the Lord's return, you're blessed according to the word of God. And now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming, 1 John 2, 28. You and I are waiting. We're not waiting for a post-tribulation rapture because we're not going through the rapture. That's what Revelation 16 is talking about. But you and I are waiting for the imminent return of Jesus to come back in the rapture, the translation of the church, which can occur at any second. You have to differentiate. I don't have time to develop all this. You know, we get into five-hour Bible study. But when you talk about the second coming, there's two phases of it. You and I are usually referring to the rapture, which is imminent can happen any second. But the second coming of Christ to this earth, Revelation 19, when he comes back and wipes out the, the battle, uh, the armies at the Battle of Armageddon, that's his second advent coming to this earth. When he comes back in the rapture, what you and I are waiting for, he's not coming to the earth. He's going to, we're going to meet him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. But this here is tribulation, but I'm still making a spiritual application because we're going through the seven Beatitudes. Uh, Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth. Keepeth his garments. That's the thing concerning the tribulation, which I don't have time to go into. And we went over in our verse-by-verse -verse study in Revelation Lest he walk naked, we talked about that also in the study, and they see his shame. So there is, we can make spiritual application and say this, there is, you need to walk with the Lord because you'll be at the shame at the judgment seat of Christ. That when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. 1 John 2, 28. So this here, Revelation 16, 15, watch for Jesus Christ's return. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh, Matthew 24, 44. We're to watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26, 41. Now, the fourth one. I want to get to this one. Turn to Revelation 19 for the fourth one. The fourth beatitude. Blessed. Blessed, blessed is the man. Blessed is the person that does this. Blessed is the man. Uh, Revelation 19, 9. 19, 9. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. <clears throat> this is the fourth blessed, the attitude. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. We will attend the marriage supper of the Lamb before the thousand year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It'll be sometime after the tribulation, but before the thousand-year millennial reign. Praise God for that. And don't spiritualize it like a lot of people do. We're going to eat supper. Amen. And Baptists love to eat supper. Amen. As a matter of fact, Baptists like to eat any time. But anyways, uh, so uh, they the, the talk about the marriage supper uh, of the Lamb. And uh, that's what you and I uh, are waiting for, the marriage supper. Uh, supper of the Lamb. Uh, think about the marriage supper of the Lamb. I've got a few things about this.
There are many suppers mentioned in the Bible. For example, Mark 6.21, King Herod made a supper to his lords on his birthday. And at this supper, John the Baptist had his head uh, cut off as a reward for the ungodly dance of Herod's stepdaughter Herodias. Uh, in Luke 14, we're told that a certain man made a great supper and bade many to come. In John 12, we're told that in the city of Bethany, Jesus had supper with Lazarus and his sisters, Martha and Mary. Uh, each of the Gospels gives an account of the Passover supper, or as it's traditionally known as the Last Supper that Jesus had with his 12 apostles. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul talks about it. Uh, he delivers to us that which he received from the Lord, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a memorial or a time of remembrance. And I preached a message on it about, about a few weeks ago. Uh, three suppers mentioned in the book of Revelation. Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come in to him and will sup. S-U-P. Sup. That's what Jesus said. I will sup with him and he with me. And so that's a supper of salvation and fellowship. All right. I know technically it's talking to the church at Laodicea, but we apply it for salvation because uh, there, the doorknob is on the inside of the heart. And every unsaved person has a heart and they, the doorknob is on the inside. And Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. I'm glad he knocked on my heart's door, amen, many amen. years ago. And I have a, a, the knob is on the inside, and I opened it up and said, come on in, Jesus. I repent of my sins and receive you as my personal Savior, amen? amen. Every individual is given an invitation to sup with the Lord, to partake of the supper of salvation and fellowship. That door of each person's heart that Jesus is standing outside of has a knob on only one side of the door on the inside. Jesus cannot force his way into anybody's heart. Jesus never burglarizes the human will. The Lord will never make you get saved. The Lord will never make you serve him after you get saved. The Lord will never make you come to church. The Lord will never, if the Lord did, everybody would be in church. The Lord will never make you pray, read your Bible, witness, give, whatever. He'll never make you do anything. Now, sometimes God can make you wish that you did. All right? And, uh, I mean, my mom and dad didn't make me do things when I was a little boy at home. But they, if I didn't do them, they made me wish that I did do them. Amen? And uh, so... Uh, God, a person must open the door to his heart voluntarily to Jesus Christ. Uh, so this supper is, uh, I call it the supper of salvation, the supper of fellowship with the Lord, because that technically is to the church at Laodicea. And he says, if any man will open the door, I'll come in to him and we'll sup with him. That's communion, that's fellowship. God wants to have communion and fellowship with us. Not just when we get saved, but continue 50 years after we get saved. He wants to have that. And uh, then the second supper is the supper of the saints or the marriage supper of the Lamb. In Revelation 19, uh, verses 6 to 9, and the church, that is the body of believers, all the way from Pentecost to the rapture, will be presented now to Christ as a bride for marriage. The marriage takes place in heaven and after the judgment seat of Christ near the end of the tribulation. The bride of Christ is now ready for the marriage. To be ready, the bride to be ready, she has to be without spot or wrinkle, a glorious church, according to Ephesians 5, 27. This is done by the purging and cleansing that will take place at the judgment seat of Christ. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is for, to cleanse us and purge us and to get all that judgment out of the way. Then the marriage and this marriage supper takes place in heaven. Then the Lord will return at the second advent, not only to judge the earth, but also to begin a thousand-year honeymoon with his bride. Yeah. Can you imagine a thousand-year honeymoon with Jesus Christ here on this earth? Think about it. I mean, as I mentioned, Aaron and Grace, my son, of course, married him yesterday, and uh, they're on their honeymoon now. And, uh, and uh, 
And, but they're not going to be on a thousand year honeymoon. Amen. It's not only going to be a few days. And, uh, and then they're coming back. To be finally married to the one that we have been espoused to as a chaste virgin. To finally be forever with the one that we have been waiting for. And then uh, there's the supper of the great God in Revelation 19, verses 17 to 21. I don't have time to read all these verses. We'll be here all day. But the supper of the great God is in Revelation 19, verses 17 to 21. And the Lord is about to return at any time for his bride. The rapture of the church could happen at any time now. And then the tribulation of seven years will begin sometime after the rapture. We usually imply that it's going to be you know, 10 seconds after the rapture, but it might not be that soon. It might be a few days, weeks, months, or I don't know. Uh, the supper of the great God, described in Revelation 19, <coughs> verses 17 to 21, will take place at the end of the tribulation. Those invited to the supper are not individuals to sup with Christ and receive salvation like Revelation 3.20 that we just spoke about a few minutes ago. And those invited to this supper are not the, the saved from the day of Pentecost to the rapture, as I mentioned a moment ago. No, those present at this supper in Revelation 19, verses 17 and 21, are you listening to this? Are birds of the air that are invited. You say, what? Yes. Buzzards, vultures, ravens, and eagles. Revelation 19, verses 17 to 21 in the King James Bible. Birds that we often see on the road eating the remains of the roadkill. You say, what? The food these birds are feasting on are the remains, listen, of Christ rejecting people. You say, is that in the Bible? Yes. You say, I thought that was figurative and symbolical. Oh, no. It's literal. Literally, people who made up the Antichrist army, men who made up the Antichrist army, and who fought and fell at the Battle of Armageddon. There's a good chance that if you're not saved and you go through the tribulation, that you may end up on the dinner table of these birds. Revelation 19, verses 17 to 21. The supper of the great God. And God invites all the eagles and the vultures and all the birds of the air to come and feast on the carcasses, the human remains, the human beings that are destroyed at the Battle of Armageddon. You say, preacher, what about... We don't have the kind time to go through the book of Revelation and explain all this. I'm just giving you a brief summary. It would take hours. It would take hours. Believe me, hours. And so, uh, Revelation 19, uh, verse 9, And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Think about this. I've got here at the top of my Bible, if I can read it. Uh, notice there's not a word about what is on the table, uh, except it looks like uh, here in, in, in Revelation 19, 9, uh, G with Jesus there, the bounty of the banquet is scarcely worth a thought. In 19.9, attention is drawn to the blessedness of being one of the king's invited guests. Now, 19.17, the supper of the great God, verse 18 says that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, just like I just told you, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. You see that? They're going to feast on mankind. What a time. Well, I'm glad I'm saved. Amen. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not going to be feasted on by these stinking rotten birds. Amen. Thank God for that. Now, look quickly. Look at chapter 20 so we can get another one in here. Look at chapter 20. And uh, here's the fifth uh Beatitude, Revelation 20, verse 6. <clears throat> Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. You see that? Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. That's you and I. On such... It says, uh, the second death hath no power. Uh, 
Uh, the second death. I thank God if you're saved, the second death don't have no power on you. Because you're going to you're going to have part of the first resurrection. Don't have time to go into all this either. First resurrection consists of three parts, three harvests. Uh, Old Testament saints, when the bodies of many of the saints which slept and rose when Jesus uh, died on the cross, Matthew 27, 50 to 52. Many bodies of the saints which slept and rose, Old Testament saints, tribulation saints. Uh, or the church age saints, you and I are going to be uh, resurrected and then tribulation saints, we've gone over this in great detail, they reign as priests and they reign as kings on the earth for a thousand years that gives us our position very clearly in this dispensation when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died as a prophet he was buried, arose from the dead and became our high priest in heaven when he comes back he will come back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That means that in this present dispensation, you and I are prophets. He's given it the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10. You tell people you need to get saved, you're going to go to hell. You just prophesied to them. You get saved, you go to heaven. You prophesy. You get saved, you get a new body, and you get to heaven. You prophesy. You get saved, you're going to walk on streets of gold. You prophesy. And on, and on, and on, and on. We have a high priest in heaven, and when Christ comes back, we will be priests and kings and interceding for the people on earth during the millennium and reigning as kings over these people in the millennial kingdom. Uh, the theme of the Old Testament is the second coming of Christ. The day of the Lord, and in particular the day of God, stretches from the battle of Armageddon forward a thousand years to the great white throne judgment and the creations of the new heavens and the new earth. That is, one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, 2 Peter 3 8. Not only is the day of the Lord spoken of as referring to the second coming of Christ to reign, but also refers to the end of this thousand year reign when the heavens and the earth melt with fervent heat, according to Peter in 2 Peter 3 10 to 14. Here, the day of the Lord is also referred to as the day of God. And I could go on and on, but I'm not. There's so much stuff. But we see here that this the first resurrection consists of or is made up of three resurrections. The resurrection of Old Testament saints, Matthew 27, 50 to 52, and Ephesians 4, church age saints, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, the rapture of the dead in Christ shall rise first, so forth and so on. And then tribulation saints in Revelation 12, Revelation 14, and, and Matthew 24. We born-again Christians are not worried about the second resurrection. We are resurrected at least a thousand years before this time. The unsaved people are one of the ones going to be here at the second resurrection. And we come up to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ and attend the marriage supper of the Lamb before the thousand-year reign of Christ begins. Let me give you these last two real quick. Look at 22.7, Revelation 22.7. <clears throat> I can preach all day on these things. Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed. There's the beatitude. Blessed is, the, is he that keepeth the sayings, the prophecy of this book. Just like back in chapter 1, verse 3. Revelation is the only book in the Bible where God promises a blessing to those who read, hear, and keep those things which are written therein. And that's why the devil has tried for a hundred years now at least to get the Christians, the body of Christ, to not even go to the book of Revelation, to ignore it, to say that it's figurative and symbolical and it's not for today and it's not relevant for today. You hear all these dumb things. The book of Revelation is very relevant for today. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Uh, the, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings, the prophecy of this book. In other words, obeying the prophecies and keeping them in your hearts and minds and thinking about them. Be ready when he comes back. When he says, uh, 22 7, behold, I come quickly. Notice he says it again in verse 12. <coughs> behold, I come quickly. See that? He says it again, verse 20, three times in this chapter. He which testifies these things say, Surely I come quickly. You see that? Quickly. That doesn't refer to the time element because he didn't come back right back then. 
When he said 2,000 years ago, I come quickly, he never came. But when he says when he comes back quickly, it's referring to the manner of his coming. When the Lord comes back, he's going to come quickly. It's not going to take him 40 years to come back. You understand what I'm saying? When he says, behold, I come quickly, he said it hundreds and thousands of years ago, and obviously he didn't mean quickly in the sense that I'm coming back right now, because he didn't come back 2,000 years ago when John wrote Revelation. It's been 2,000 years, so that isn't very quick. When he says, behold, I come quickly, he means when he comes back, boom, he's going to be, it's going to be quick. Amen? Amen? But look at 22, uh, 7, behold, I come quickly, blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy, of this book. So you're blessed again, he says in 22. And then last of all, as I close, look at chapter 22, verse 14. 22, 14. This is the uh, seventh beatitude in the book of Revelation. And this is a tribulation verse doctrinally. This is a verse that the seventh day Adventist and all their self-righteous religious people that are trying to get to heaven by good works use to teach you today in the church age that you've got to keep his commandments to go to heaven. You see how you can teach the Bible, make, you can make the Bible teach anything you want if you don't rightly divide it? Let's read it. And you know what a lot of fundamentalists do? They change it. Because they don't know how to explain it. And they know that works don't have anything to do with your salvation to keep the commandments, so they change the verse. That's wrong too. You don't change the Bible. 22.14 Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Blessed are they that... Do you see that? That do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. Hey, we're already in heaven when this is true doctrine. You don't need it. You don't need the tree of life. You've got eternal life through a person, Jesus Christ. This is talking about the end of the tribulation and then the millennium. Tree of life. I don't have time. I don't have time to go through all that. I mean, here's my notes in Revelation. Let me explain all that. <laughs> Uh, we'd be here all day. And so, but, but when you come to Revelation, especially, you have to rightly divide it. Blessed are they that do His commandments in the tribulation there. And we've gone over this uh, about the uh, keeping the commandment, do His commandments. Uh, right to the tree of life is not eternal life, which is in Jesus Christ. It's talking about the tree of life. Remember the trees? He talks about the trees. Look at 22.1. 22.1, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. This is out into eternity. This is out in the millennium and beyond. Proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. Leaves the tree, 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 tree. See that? Tree all down through there. And uh, the tree of life. And he talks about the tree, the tree, the tree. And uh, he talks about the nations. In chapter 21, it talks about the different nations. Uh, that those nations are saved by taking care of the Jews and works and works and commandments and all that. We went through all that in Revelation. I mean, there's so much. And uh, it's just a short 40-minute message to get out. But in Revelation 22, 14, blessed are they that do His commandments. They may have a right to the tree of life. I don't need to do His commandments to have a right to the tree of life. I've already been in heaven for many, many years when this takes place here, doctrinally. We've already been raptured. We've already been in heaven for many years. i got eternal life, not through a tree. See, I read this verse when I first got saved. I read, I read these verses. Blessed are they that do His commandments. Do I have to do His commandments to get eternal life? That they may have right to the tree of life. I never hear Paul say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll have a part of the tree of life. Millennium, honey. Tribulation, end of tribulation and millennium. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman, workman, it's work, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Revelation 22, 14, where does that go? Not in the church age, because I don't have to do his commandments to get to heaven, first of all. And secondly, I don't need the tree of life. I got eternal life through Jesus Christ. You find you find anywhere in the Pauline epistles where Paul says, Believe on the faith, and you're justified by faith, and you also get the tree of life. Paul don't mention a tree of life one time in his epistles. This is tribulation and millennium. Read Revelation 21 and 22. And there's so much stuff here. I mean, all through here. Revelation 21 and 22. All through here. Now, we can make spiritual application, so I'll, I'll close with this. Blessed are they that do his commandments. 
Now, I don't need to, I don't need to have a right to the tree of life because I'm already going to be in heaven. <clears throat> this doesn't doctrinally apply to me, but we can devotionalize it and spiritualize it, any verse. And we can say this, in the church age today, you're blessed if you do his commandments. God will bless you, and I can take you to Exodus 20 and show you the Ten Commandments, but there's commandments all through the Bible, Old and New Testament. Any person is blessed at any time during any age if they do and keep his commandments. But today, you don't have to do his commandments to have a right to the tree of life. You may, and what's it say? It says that they may enter in through the gates into the city. I'm already in the city, baby. I don't need the tree of life. I got eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen. But as I close, these are seven uh, beatitudes uh, in the book of Revelation. And uh, of course, in Exodus 20, commands, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not all this and that. I mean, all that. Any, any dispensation from Adam and Eve to the end of the millennium. You're blessed. You're going to be blessed if you do his commandments and keep his commandments and stay right with God and be faithful to the Lord. Amen. Let's stand. Seven beatitudes.